Check out FlipSideGaming.com for all your gaming needs. Use the promo code HEROES to save 10% on all orders over $10 and support the channel at the same time. Hey there, this is John from Heroes and Legends, and welcome to our Dominaria pre-release primer, where today we're going to talk about everything you need to know if you're planning on attending one of the Dominaria pre-releases. What to bring, highlights from the set as far as mechanics, color synergies, talk a little bit about deck building, that type of stuff. This is probably meant for newer players who maybe have never gone before, but even players who played a few pre-releases may get something out of it, especially if you haven't been following all the previews and all of that. We're going to talk a lot about the set in here too. So quickly, before we get started though, just a really fast reminder, if you check out the description below, you'll find a few ways to help support what we do here at the channel, one of which is our Patreon page. You're also going to find product links to Amazon down below. If you make any purchases on Amazon, actually no matter what it is, once you go through that link, We'll get a small percentage for the channel. And finally, Flipside Gaming still offering a promo code for our viewers. Hopefully you can save some cash while you support us at the same time. As always, thank you not only to the folks that look at those links, but to everybody who watches and participates in the channel. Thank you all for everything you do. And with that being said, let's get into it. All right, the big question, what should you bring? Well, the first thing I would bring is knowledge. And what I mean by that is call your LGS ahead of time. Many LGSs will need you to pre-register because they have limited space, for example. Others might be doing something different that you're not expecting. And it's just good to have all that information. And what I mean by that is typically stores are going to be running sealed events for pre-release. However, it's not unusual for a store to do at least one two-headed giant competition over the course of the weekend. And you do need a partner for that. Not to say you need to bring a partner with you to the store. You might be able to find somebody there to play with. But you should at least probably know that going in. Also, too, every once in a while, a store will do something funny with prize support and add extra prize support. And in those cases, you might be paying more for the entry fee, or you could be there a lot longer because a lot of times they'll kind of turn it into a pre-release format to a normal tournament format, which could be many rounds. If the prizes are good, it could be like an all-day thing. So just be aware of that before you go. And typically, what you can expect, though is usually three to five rounds of Swiss. I've seen different stores do different things. Swiss rounds means you play every round, even if you lose, and then you'll win packs based on what your record was at the end of those rounds. And if you go 0-4 oh, or whatever, that's still okay. You might not get any prizes, but you can play every single round. And that's what it's all about. You also keep the contents of your pre-release kit, so you will get cards from there at least. Okay, so what else do you need to bring with you? First and foremost, pen and paper. I know it sounds kind of simple, but it's easy to forget. A lot of times, if you never played in a tournament before, you'll need to fill out a DCI form for a DCI number, and you need a pen to do that. Usually, stores will ask you to fill out your information on paper, too, so they can put it into the computer quickly for the tournament. And again, you don't want to wait in line for a pen, borrow pens, or worse yet, I've seen stores sell pens. That's no good. So bring them with you. Also, too, if you have inclinations of getting into more competitive play in the future, it's not a bad idea to get into the habit of starting to keep track of you and your opponent's life totals on pen and paper, because what's going to happen is it's not important for this tournament, but if you ever want to play in a more competitive tournament, that is kind of the acceptable way to keep track of life totals. So if you want to start those habits, it's not a horrible idea. Sleeves, spring sleeves. Now, you don't need a play mat necessarily if you're playing in like one tournament, because they can be kind of expensive. I would recommend getting a playmat, though, if you're going to play at LGSs frequently, because tables are not always going to be the cleanest. And even if your cards are in sleeves, the sleeves will get tacky and sometimes hard to shuffle. So the cleaner you can keep your cards in your sleeves, the better. Now, for just one tournament, sleeves are just fine, but I would make sure you have more than 40. Your deck's going to be about 40 cards. You want at least 45 sleeves in case a couple of them break. You don't have to either go without or buy sleeves there. Some players like to bring some pre-sleeve basic lands with them. Because during that deck building time, your LGSs will have lands for you, but a lot of times you have to go find them and wait in line, then grab the ones you need, bring them back, sleeve them. So if you want to really take advantage of the full time allotted to build your deck, it's a nice little shortcut. Don't have to do it, but some people do like to do that. An extra deck box. Again, your contents of your pre-release kit come in a cardboard deck box. You'll see that in a moment. But they're really fragile and can get beat up in your backpack. So I would bring something that's a little more sturdy, like a plastic deck box, especially if you're going to be there for a while playing a couple different events, perhaps. That way you can keep your card pools separate, or if you want to take anything out that you want to trade and put it in a different box, or a trade binder even would be fine. And I would bring some extra dice. The spin down die that you will get in your pre-release kit is fine for keeping track of life if you just want to be casual about it. 
it's fine for rolling to see who goes first if you want to be casual. But typically, once you get into more competitive play, there's kind of a faux pas about rolling a spin down die to decide who goes first because the numbers aren't randomized. Most of the time, people prefer that you roll randomized dice. And also, the dice are going to help you keep track of other things in the game state. It'll be a lot easier than trying to find something else to use to keep track of counters or something like that. The last thing I would say is bring a snack and water, especially bottled water with you. Stay hydrated. You'll play better if you're not hungry or thirsty, especially. So just make sure you have something like even if it's just like granola bars or protein bars or something like that, depending on the time of day you go, you might miss like a meal time. So just be cognizant of that. And events can last a while, even if you're playing four rounds. I mean, by the time you build your deck and everything, you might be there five, six hours, depending on how quick the tournament goes. So that's a big commitment that you just want to be aware of. So you'll play better if you're not starving. Some stores will sell snacks, but they're usually expensive, and many times they're things like candy, chips, soda, which may not help your focus. Here is the pre-release kit. As you can see here, you'll get six packs of Dominaria, the spin-down die I had mentioned. What you don't see in the picture, though, is you're going to get two promo cards. One is going to be a foil promo with a date stamp on it that is of any rare or mythic in the set, completely random. The other one, we haven't seen them do this before, this is new, but they're giving us a, another foil card that they say is also date stamped and is a legendary card. Now, they didn't say if it's just rare or mythic because there are uncommon legendaries. I guess we'll find out soon enough. But you will have two additional cards. You can use the contents of those six packs as well as those two additional cards to build your deck if you choose to. We'll talk more about deck building in just a few moments. But before we get into the gritty details of that, in case you haven't been following along with like previews and such, we'll talk a little bit about what you can expect from the set. We'll begin with the mechanics. There's a few new mechanics here. There's also a returning mechanic. Legendary is a big part of this set, and you're going to find a new kind of legendary card within called Legendary Sorcery. Just like a regular sorcery, and as a matter of fact, these are very powerful and very reasonably costed, but they do have a drawback. You must have a legendary creature or planeswalker in play for you to cast the spell. So you do have to keep that in mind when it comes to your deck building. You want to make sure you have enough legendary creatures, if you're lucky a Planeswalker, but at least legendary creatures, so that you are at least confident most of the time you're going to be able to cast a legendary sorcery if you happen to have one. If not, you might not want to put it in your deck, so just be mindful of that. Now the good news is, if you have a legendary creature in play, for example, and you cast this and then your opponent destroys it while it's on the stack, it's still okay. The spell will still resolve. You just have to have the requirement at the time of casting. Sagas. Sagas are a new enchantment that really call back to the old days of Dominaria through the art and the flavor. And they work in a very unique way. Basically, the way this works is we'll use the one on the screen as an example. You're going to pay a blue and three. The enchantment will go on the stack and then resolve, enter the battlefield. When that happens, it will get a lore counter, and that will be the first lore counter. So when you have one lore counter on it, the following will happen, whatever it says next to number one. So in this case, tap target creature and opponent controls. It doesn't untap during its controller's untap step for as long as you control time of ice. Okay, so then once you end your turn and your opponent goes, you come back to your turn. At the end of your draw step, as you go into your pre-combat main phase, you're going to put another lore counter on this. Lore counters do not use the stack, however the abilities that trigger do. So, number two, now that you have two lower counters, will actually be the same thing on this card. However, some will have different number ones and number twos. And then finally, comes back to your turn again after your draw step. You're going to put the third lower counter on and then return all tapped creatures to their owner's hand. That will go on the stack. The ability does go on the stack, even if the lower counter doesn't. It resolves, and after number three happens, you're going to sacrifice the saga. There's a card in red that you might come across that when you attack, it's a creature that's 2-2, but it will add a lore counter to a saga. If that's the case, it will add the lore counter at a time that normally you wouldn't add a lore counter. However, everything happens the same. You put the counter on, depending on which number it is, the ability will go on the stack and you'll just continue. So just keep that in mind. Ultimately, some of these can be very powerful. Just read them carefully. Now the next mechanic is really more of a redefinition of a group of cards, giving them a new title, and it's historic. Basically what they're saying is artifacts, legendaries, and sagas are considered historic. And you will find cards that interact with historic. A lot of cards will say if you cast a historic spell, do something, in this case scry one. 
So watch out for that. They're going to be sprinkled throughout the set, although you will find higher density of those in white and blue, which we'll talk about in a few moments. But just remember, artifacts, anything that says legendary on it, and saga, all of those are considered historic now. And finally, kicker. You might remember kicker. This is an older mechanic that's come back. Basically, what it means is I can either cast the spell for the regular casting cost, or I may pay an additional cost for the kicker, and if I do, I get more of a benefit out of it. In this example, Wild Onslaught, I pay a green and three. If I do, I put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature I control. However, if I decide to pay a green and seven instead because there's a kicker option of four there, then I will instead put two plus one, plus one counters on each creature I control. And that's basically how it works. Relatively simple. Archetypes. All right, let's talk about what this set's trying to do between the various colors. And this is probably more critical information for drafting. However, I think it's still really important for sealed play as well. Because when you look at your seal pool, if you know what cards are trying to work together and what combos might be within the colors, you're going to zero in on those quicker, especially when you have limited deck building time. So I think this is good information to know. So let's talk about what each pair of colors is trying to do. White-blue, I mentioned this already, but they have a strong historic focus. So you will see a lot of cards that will say when you cast the historic spell, something will happen. Throwing in some additional artifacts will sometimes be helpful in these type of builds, but many times the legendaries and sagas may have you covered already. White and black is all about night tribal, and if you're all about little creatures of first strike that have ways to get enhanced as the game goes on, this is maybe the color pairing for you. White and red. Overarching, these colors are worried about aggressiveness. They like small, fast creatures. You'll find haste creatures, things with menace, for example, some flying for evasion in white. But one other little side thing they are doing, and it's not super consistent, but it's there, is there's a little bit of a affection for equipment. And you're going to find that in some cards here and there. So just keep that in mind. Sometimes you might have a piece of equipment that is almost unplayable, but it becomes so much better if you have, say, one of the cards that you see on the screen here. White and green. Now, this is all about creatures and creature density. Going wide is part of what this is trying to do. You can make sapperling tokens in green, sometimes knight tokens in white, or just a lot of small creatures. And green also has some big payoff creatures as well on the upper end of the curve. But it's all about just overwhelming your opponent with the creatures. Blue and black. Now, black has some reanimation elements attached to it, as well as some elements that will take cards from the graveyard, bring them back to your hand. Blue has a little bit of self-mill going on. So this is a slower, more methodical controlling build, but could lead to some big plays at times. All right, blue and red. And this is another try focus here. It's wizards this time, but where knights were more brute force, wizards want to play with instants and sorceries. If you are in these colors, you might have a higher amount of instants and sorceries than you normally have because there are a lot of payouts with the wizards. And there's also synergies between the wizards themselves. Blue-green. Green's got a lot of ramp in this particular set. And a lot of times the problem with ramp is that you get all your ramp spells and not your creature spells or vice versa. Well, blue helps smooth that out a little bit. They have scry, they have card draw. And there's also a light land matter is even out of the graveyard theme in green. So the self mill that you see in some of the blue cards could help you there from time to time as well. So this might be your best pair of colors if you're really interested in ramping into large things. Black and red. You may have heard the type of deck called aristocrats in the past. What that means is basically sacrifice for benefit. And that's what black and red are trying to do. You're going to see a lot of small creatures that can be sacrificed for different abilities and then also ways to bring those creatures back sometimes, whether it's to the battlefield or back to your hand. Green and black. So as you can see from the screen here, fungi and sapperlings are a big piece of these two colors. You can create sapperling tokens. You have some fungi. There's a lord like you see Spore Crown Thalid here. There are a lot of interesting interactions, and you can also use these sapperling tokens to sacrifice to a lot of the black creatures for benefit. Green and red. All right, they have a big focus on kicker. You're going to see kicker throughout the set. However, these two colors have a higher density of it, which makes sense considering the ramp elements in green. All right, let's talk about deck construction really quick here. The first thing you want to remember is that 40 cards is the minimum amount you can have in the deck, and I would go for 40. Some people will play sometimes 41 or 42. They can't decide what to cut, but I'll tell you right now, I promise you, that there's at least one of those cards that's just not quite as good as all the others. Maybe the trick is figuring which one that is. 
but there's no reason to dilute your card pool at all. Go with the minimum number. Use your best cards. Now, how many lands do you put in those 40 cards? Usually 16 to 18. I think 17 is a pretty safe number almost all the time. There are moments where I'll go down to 16 lands, and that's if maybe I have a really low curve for some reason. Maybe I only have like one 5-drop and nothing higher, or perhaps not even a 5-drop. Then I will think about going down to 16 lands. Or maybe I have some other cards that create mana for me, like creatures or artifacts. But I don't consider that like a one-for-one. One. For example, I have a Lanawar Elf, which will tap for one green mana. Doesn't mean I'm going to go down to 16 lands. Now, if I have a couple of those, maybe a Mana Rock or something, then I might consider it. 18 land decks are really if you are going a little higher curve. So maybe you just have an extra big bomb that you care about or an extra five drop and you're just feeling a little heavier on the high end. Go with the 18th land. Also, sometimes if you have a lot of instants in your deck, 18 lands might be helpful because you want to hold back and actually play a couple things at one time or hold back for an instant. Now that's more draft typically than seal, but it's just something to think about. Creatures, I'll usually go about 15 to 17. You want a really strong creature base in these sealed games because it usually comes down to what's happening on the battlefield. Are there times I do go less? Sure, maybe if I'm in Is It Colors, Red, Blue, I could have some extra instances and sorceries that are really good. So that does vary a little bit, but most of the time, it's pretty safe to say 15 to 17 is where you end up or should end up. Following the creatures, removal spells are probably the next most important thing. So what about your curve? Well... One mana spells, I usually do zero to two. A lot of times you don't get good one mana spells. Typically, there's maybe one or two in the set. Land of War Elves, I just mentioned, that would be a really good one. Um, but sometimes you won't have any. Sometimes you'll have one, maybe two if you're really lucky. Now, the two spot is hypercritical, and this is the spot in my deck I actually stack the highest. Typically, I'll go four to six here. And even if I have to use two drops and no abilities or two drops that have abilities that just don't really probably work out for me, I still might run them if they're like two twos, for example, because you just need that board presence. It's critically important so you don't get overrun early in the game. Next, the third spot, three to five, I feel is about right. Typically a little less than the two spot, but still relatively heavy. You're going to find some more powerful things here. And also, too, just keep in mind, a lot of times people go a little too heavy on threes and a little too light on twos, because sometimes the twos just don't look as exciting as the threes and fours, right? But they are critical. The four spots. Two to four. You don't want to get crazy here. Just be really conservative. Use your best ones. Same with the five spot. One to three spells. These should be your best spells. Sometimes I don't even have any fives in certain situations, but one to three, you're still safe. Six or more, I would go zero to two, maybe even zero a lot of the time. But if you have a strong bomb that's expensive, go for it. One or two of those won't kill you. And the other thing I will say is this particular set feels like it's going to play a little bit slower. So it is a powerful set, but it does feel like it could be grindier. So going a little bigger probably won't punish you that much. So if you shift these numbers over a little bit, just a little bit to the heavier end, I think you're going to be okay in Dominaria. So just keep that in mind too. But this is just generally what I'm looking to do. And just remember, creatures first and foremost, removal spells, you want to prioritize those. And also too, remember to look for creatures with evasion, flying, menace, things like that. So you know you're going to be able to get that damage across at the right time. All right, that is our pre-release primer. Good luck this weekend. Let me know in the comments below, either this video or another video this weekend, how things go. Tomorrow, we are going to be putting up a special edition of the Market Watch to talk about Dominaria. Even though the prices of the singles are going to shift pretty dramatically over the next few weeks, I think it's always important that opening weekend, people know what cards are worth so you don't get pulled into a bad trade or a bad deal. So we're going to discuss maybe some of the more expensive cards you could be opening over the weekend. And then on Saturday, we'll also do our regular market watch. So until then, hey, thanks for watching. Please remember to like, subscribe. Have a great day. Hey, thanks for watching. This video is made possible by the generous support of viewers like you on Patreon. Check out the description below for links to our Patreon page as well as our Amazon affiliate store, where a small percentage of all sales will also help support the channel. Finally, if you haven't had a chance yet to subscribe, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any new videos on Heroes and Legends. Talk to you again soon, and have a great day.